Welcome to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson and I ask my guests one simple question, why? Focusing on the importance of why, I share with you the relatable, uplifting and inspiring conversations I have with people from all walks of life. This podcast will encourage you to focus on your why to enable and empower you to achieve the success you desire. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Welcome to this week's Reflections and Observations for the Focus on Why podcast. This is episode 42, I can't believe it. And it's been an incredible two weeks of having guests on the show. Each guest's why has proved to be so different and I've loved every single one of them. So here are my reflections and observations for the last six guests. First up is Danny Gray, episode 36, Put Your War Paint On. I knew early on that Danny just had to come on the Focus on Why podcast because I've been following his journey ever since I saw him on Dragon's Den last year and have been charting his rise of success ever since. I don't watch much TV and I just saw Danny when I was just flicking through the channels with my daughter and husband. We were just transfixed watching his pitch as were all five dragons. It was an emotional roller coaster to watch, and I can't begin to imagine how Dan must have felt alone to make a decision on the future of his company. We did talk about this in the episode. Danny is loved by so many people, and since releasing his episode last week, I have received hundreds of messages sharing just how he has changed their lives, inspiring them to be more confident in their own bodies. Danny's why is personal, and his passion shines through the Warpaint for Men brand. Danny believes that makeup should be available for everyone and after years of talking about it, he finally took action to make his dream possible. In founding Warpaint for Men, Danny has given men all over the world more than makeup. He's given them confidence. He has created a brand that helps men who are struggling with stuff when they just didn't need to. Sharing his personal story about body dysmorphia and lack of confidence, Danny is now opening doors for men across the world and proving that Warpaint for Men makeup is more than just another brand. It helps men have that confidence to be the real versions of themselves. Bullied from the age of 10 due to his appearance, combined with a diagnosis of body dysmorphic disorder, Danny found that makeup gave him his confidence back. And this is why he wanted to create Warpaint a safe place that men can come and find out about makeup that has been designed and marketed specifically towards them. They can ask the questions they may not be comfortable to ask somewhere else. What I have witnessed is how many men have reached out to me saying that they really resonated with Danny's story, asking me how they could get in touch with him to thank him directly. By sharing why he created the products and how he uses the products, men understand the value and the benefits. One of the comments made on, on one of my social media threads stopped me in my tracks. Why shouldn't men be able to use cosmetics to enhance their appearance? Why shouldn't it be available as a mainstream product? This is why Danny made it very clear from the outset that the makeup is available for everyone, which has subsequently enabled so many people to access it who may not have felt makeup was targeted for them. Just goes to prove that by not making any assumptions about who is consuming the product, He's reached out and helped so many more people. One person can change an industry and market perception. When we watch TV and film or flick through magazines, we see makeup being readily applied to both men and women. I wonder why being in front of a camera or on the stage historically has been deemed automatically acceptable to don a full face of makeup. Curious to chart the use of makeup throughout history, I did a bit of research I was fascinated to be reminded what part makeup has played for men across the millennia. In 4000 BCE, the Egyptians used black pigment to make cat eye shapes. Men several millennia later used makeup to look more attractive to the gods Horus and Ra and worn off illnesses wearing green malachite eyeshadow and black coal pencil. The Romans in 1st century AD applied red pigment to their cheeks, whitened their skin with powder and painted their nails. Apparently, men would also paint their heads to cover up bald spots, although I'm not sure how effective that would have been. Elizabethan England makeup was very popular for men, although it was heavily lead laden and actually ended up being fatal in cases. 
King Louis XVI, going bald in his early 20s, convinced aristocratic society to wear excessively large wigs and makeup with an obsession for painting on beauty spots. It was only in the mid 1800s under Queen Victoria's reign that makeup was deemed vulgar and considered an abomination by the crown and the church, creating strong associations with vanity and the devil's work. This led to the rapid decline in the use of makeup by men, and over time, since that time in history, it went out of fashion for men to wear makeup, and with that, the acceptance. With the advent of Hollywood, it was made acceptable for men on screen to wear makeup again, and in the 70s and 80s, a handful of various male pop stars took makeup into their own hands. But this was still very much on the periphery and not mainstream. However, ironically, many makeup artists were, were, at the time were men. Slowly, in the early 2000s, men started to wear eyeliner. And then we get to today, where finally it's not just for those on stage and screen. Men are using makeup and it's becoming more mainstream for everyday use for covering those imperfections. The makeup industry has evolved and perceptions have shifted. Next episode up is episode 37, Real Life 1.0 with Tej. Tej Singh was born to be an entrepreneur. Tej is an international podcasting, brand building, property investor. And on this life changing podcast, his words, not mine, he shares why he draws on the Stoics to steer him through life or real life 1.0 to real life 2.0, as he describes it, using a quote from the great Stoic Marcus Aurelius to summarize how he lives his life. If it is not right, do not do it. If it is not true, do not say it. This is something I totally subscribe to. Ted is so honest, enthusiastic and direct with an overwhelming passion to help as many people as he can through his podcast and network. People see Ted as an inspiration as he speaks the truth. Appearances matter to Ted, whether that is the design of effective corporate branding or the tiniest detail in a kitchen refit. He has a natural creativity that has a strong role to play in giving him that balance between business and pleasure in all of his enterprises. Ted sees his position in the property space as someone who talks realistically and candidly and negatively about how challenging and difficult it can be at times. He says, hey, everyone, look at me. I'm a human. He doesn't mind if what he says will deter people who don't have the grit or resilience necessary to do it, because at times property is challenging. I think the phrase he uses, rebellion against the accepted norm, describes Tej best as he challenges the status quo and pushes back on the things that most people don't stop and question. He refuses to pay ball and jump into the nine to five hamster wheel, saying that his decision to leave employment was just being as logical as it always is when things do not compute. As a result of working in property, Tej has become more stoic. He's become more himself, more of who he believes he is. He also talks of having learned to be a lot more patient, describing how he, he used to be really impatient and talks about Gary V, micro impatience and macro patience. I hadn't heard these particular expressions before, so I checked out what Ted was referring to. Macro patience, micro speed, strategically patient, tactically impatient, impatience with actions, patience with outcomes, a variance of the same powerful ideas expressed in different ways. This is what Gary V says. Running counter to how most organisations and people operate, as most people set ambitious short-term goals over one, two or five-year periods that involve promotions or net worth targets, they don't focus on maximising their productivity in the here and now. Gary V says that we need to take the time to orient around a longer-term direction built on principles and things that will not change. To be resolved to be very patient over the next 10 to 20 years as you move towards that direction. However, in the short term, execute with speed and impatience to maximise your rate and learning. Don't waste a moment, experiment a lot, reflect and learn fast. Gary V reminds us that we don't have much control over our journey in the next 20 years. However, we can choose to be all over the next seven days. In the long run, how we approach the weeks is all that matters. And as Tej said, time flies. It will be too late before you realise it. Don't worry about what others think. Do what works for you. Episode 38, Discipline and Regret with Sandro Forte. 
This episode provides perspective, strength of mindset, and the importance of building incredible relationships. Sandro believes that everyone has a place in life. We can all make a difference. Dare to be different is the apt name of Sandro's book, which he posted to me immediately after we recorded our conversation. And I was torn between using dare to be different or discipline and regret as a podcast title, but finally settled on discipline and regret as he references this several times during our recording together. So why discipline and regret? Discipline and regret is the mantra by which Sandro Forte lives his life. Both of those two things are very painful, he says. But if you don't do the first one in life, you're always going to get the second one by definition. So I'd much rather have the discipline to do something and follow through than I would have the pain of the regret looking back. Sandro believes and demonstrates that determination and a will to win are prerequisites for success. And he clearly knows the secrets to success. Dare to be different, Sandro's book, is a route map to entrepreneurial success, which Sandro says anyone can follow. The required elements are confidence, courage, common sense, a sound knowledge of your product market and a willingness to be different from the rest. His book is different. Every chapter requires you to take action before moving on, thus eliminating procrastination. Sandro references honesty, a willingness to learn, coupled with consistency and perseverance to determine the level of his his success. And this was echoed by the comments that many people left after listening to the podcast. A great friend of Sandro's, Cobus Klein, reached out to me on LinkedIn and shared this message, which made me so pleased that I set up the Focus on Why podcast, purely to provide the space for people like Sandro to share their stories. Sandro Forte is a deep thinker with profound ideas to make the world a better place, where he operates within as a financial planner, a knowledgeable and inspirational speaker a best-selling author, a podcast expert, a leader, and a philanthropist of note. Amy Rowlandson, the podcast could not have been more profound. While as humble as it comes and very inspirational, you have perfected the questioning technique by keeping it to the point, without making it about your voice, but to allow your guest voice to be heard, to allow for a huge value add. Well done. I could not feel prouder to have Sandro Forte as an amazing motivational friend, And we both know how we can feed off each other anytime. Carol Neal said he comes from a long line of motivated, inspiring, successful people who also had have great vision and emotional intelligence. I had the privilege of working with his family for several years, an inspiring and driven man. Angela Rigby said one from the heart. Fabulous. Listen. Catherine Fleming said Forte is Italian for strong. And I get the feeling that Sandro Forte recognised the need to show personal strength from a very early age. Another example of nominative determinism at play. Sandro has always relished being challenged. He is energetic, motivated, but above all, highly principled. And it was that which enabled him to develop a financial business that stood apart from others in the world of dubious integrity. Through his great personal success and extensive and generous network of clients and colleagues, Sandra has been able to enact significant social changes with a long history of impressive, large-scale philanthropic endeavours. But these major displays of caring for humanity sit alongside everyday gestures of kindness too, and we are all capable of making those. Something that Catherine references in her comment is nominative determination which is the hypothesis that people tend to gravitate towards areas of work that fit their names, that the name we are given has some influence over what they do with their life. The idea that people are drawn to professions that fit their name was first suggested by psychologist Carl Jung, citing as example Sigmund Freud, whose name means joy and who we know studied pleasure. This is actually the origination of many names as people were given surnames that matched their areas of craft and they then became hereditary as the crafts were passed down the generations of the family. Hence such surnames as Miller, Smith, Taylor, Baker, Fisher, Cooper, Turner, Mason, Glover. Oh, there are so many. Social scientists believe that names produce a Dorian Gray effect, which is named after the character from the Oscar Wilde novel, referring to the ways Internal factors such as self-perception influence our physicality. It's interesting, as Sandro does make reference to his full name, which is Alessandro Marco Forte. But he doesn't use it very often, purely because he feels that people are rather disappointed when they see him. 
as they were expecting a six foot two inch dark Italian looking guy. He says he has the nose and the eyebrows, but so he sticks with simply Sandro Forte, which he believes he can live up to. Sandro says he's an ordinary guy who simply believes and demonstrates day to day that determination and a will to win are prerequisites for success. However, anyone who's listened to the podcast has said that he is far from ordinary, extraordinary, as he has built one of the UK's most successful and highly respected businesses. He's been voted top conference speaker in all five continents and is described by many as warm, engaging, dynamic, funny, captivating, hugely motivating and a brilliant communicator. I absolutely loved my time with Sandro and I've actually just recorded a podcast on his podcast so you'll that will be coming soon so tune, be sure to tune in. Next episode, Create Your Ikigai with Hector Garcia, episode 39. Ikigai is a book that came into my life and will be here to stay. It has made such an impact that I had to reach out to the authors to tell them. And I managed to track down Hector via the wonderful platform that is LinkedIn. I couldn't believe it when I got the message just a week after I sent it from Hector saying he would love to come on the podcast and share his insights. Recording this podcast, I was instantly transported to the wonders that Tokyo offers how Tokyo lives in the future, yet holds firmly onto its traditions. They have deep roots with the past, and yet they're adaptable to change. It was funny to hear Hector describe how people use fax machines alongside using their 5G smartphones, or they use the old trains alongside the magnetic bullet train. Hector describes Tokyo so well, I felt I was standing there right with him, seeing the beautiful villages and the blossoms on the trees and the contrasting high-rise buildings. He did say that the blossom was lonely this year. That's really sad. He also describes the snowy images of winter and it's so beautiful. I can picture it now. I will definitely be heading over to Japan and getting Hector to show me around this incredible city that he has had such an impact on his life. Hector also shares that it was the chronic illness that he lives with daily that led him to the manifestation of this book, how he was looking for answers and how his friend Francesc, the co-author, helped him to write this book about Ikigai as therapy. He talked about how he may write about his illness one day as it's still a daily struggle, but he's not ready to write about it yet. I have a feeling it will be of a great help to so many others when he finally does put that pen to paper. Hector speaks from the heart. He writes from the heart. And this is how Focus on Why met Ikigai. So what is Ikigai? It's a simple concept, but it's powerful. When you combine your passion with your mission, with your vocation and your profession, you achieve Ikigai. What do you love doing? What does the world need? What can you be paid for? What are you good at? By focusing on what we love, We combine our passion with our mission and we achieve fulfillment. By focusing on what the world needs, we combine our mission with our vocation, solving problems and spotting market opportunities. By focusing on what we can be paid for, we combine our vocation with our profession and find comfort and value in what we can offer. By focusing on what we are good at, we combine our profession with our passion and gain satisfaction. Follow your ikigai, create your ikigai, Find the happiness of always being busy, staying active, don't retire. Find the passion inside you, that unique talent that gives you meaning to your days and drives you to share the best version of yourself. Hector says that if you are having doubts of your ikigai or your purpose in life, your purpose in life from now on should be to create your ikigai or keep trying things to align your life with your purpose. Evolution of Data with Toby Wilde, episode 40. Wow, 40, I can't believe it. What a milestone. I love speaking with Toby. Not only is Toby so passionate about what he does, he is so focused on what really matters. He is straightforward, honest, authentic and driven. He has a humility about him where he also owns up for his mistakes and challenges that he's faced. He addresses the importance of due diligence, of trust, innovation of future proofing. Recently, Toby was asked what his new company Aparo does and he wrote a post on LinkedIn to provide clarity behind the offerings of Aparo to avoid it being deemed esoteric. 
However, I think this podcast helps further to explain exactly what Aparo does and also why it does what Toby has created it to do. Not only is Toby developing prop tech and evolving the way data is used, he is using his knowledge and connections to address the immense social housing crisis we are facing with a project that draws its inspiration from modest developments from decades ago, which include gardens and are placed in the right locations. Aparo is the accumulation or as Toby describes, end dream of what he spent most of his life and career working towards. Toby sees a future of real estate becoming more reliant on the importance of data, algorithms and systems. He got into prop tech out of frustration and he shares the evolution of how the market has evolved and how he is basically unemployable. He talks of his severe dyslexia and has many ADHD traits, sharing the Harvard research on what makes a successful entrepreneur. Number one, he says, is dyslexia. Number two is to have entrepreneurial parents. And three is to have experienced personal adversity or tragedy. In fact, studies indicate that people with dyslexia are more likely to run their own business. I delved into this more, looking to see what the research is on people with dyslexia. And in fact, studies indicate that people with dyslexia are far more likely to run their own businesses, delegating authoritative and administrative roles where they have weaknesses in reading and writing and play to their strengths. They often excel in oral communication and problem solving and had developed compensatory skills. As Toby mentions, he said that he hated following orders and that is why with those with dyslexia become extraordinarily creative around manoeuvring their way through problems. Toby's dyslexia and ADHD actually serve him. They are his superpowers. He may have had to kiss a lot of frogs to find the right people, to find the princes, but he knows the importance of surrounding himself with the right people to be able to scale quickly and bring to fruition the vision he has for the future of real estate. To survive and be successful, Toby advises caution as there are sharks in this industry. You need to be financially and legally savvy to surround yourselves by only those you can truly trust. The final episode this week that I'm covering is episode 41, The Innocence Project London with Dr. Louise Hewitt. Whilst out celebrating Louise's PhD before lockdown, we started talking about what she had been spending the last 10 years working on for The Innocence Project London. And I was shocked to hear some home truths about the moral-based criminal justice system under which we operate in the UK. The Innocence Project London is part of a truly global network and together they strive to create awareness of wrongful convictions and how they can happen. Every wrongful conviction damages the legal system in which it takes place. Every wrongful conviction damages society, especially the friends and family of the person convicted. It is unrealistic to change entire legal systems in one go, but collectively we can create awareness of their flaws and look at how to improve them. This is what the Innocence Project London is looking to do. Louise stressed how important it was for her to change public perception, as without the general public awareness and support, things won't change. She is committed with her students' support to keep going until it is commonly accepted that there is an issue. Currently, people can be convicted for crimes that they did not commit. Wrongful convictions are not in the public eye. People don't question what they read in the news. Louise is driving the change that is needed and implementing a new model, the innocence model, to make it fit within our system. It is vitally important for me that I share Louise's work with the audience. It needs to be made more public and we need to be more aware of how we stand on a very fragile line on the right side of justice more often than not. And if that happens, You'd like to think that there is a mechanism in place where you'd be able to support your friends, your family members and be able to get out of that situation. Louise raises a point that the whole prison system relies on people admitting their guilt before they can move on. But what if you're innocent? Does that mean you have to admit your guilt even when you know yourself to be innocent? It's a catch-22 situation that makes for very uncomfortable decisions. What does innocence mean to you? It has certainly made me stop and question the system. It used to be innocent until proven guilty, but actually, is that even the case anymore? These are my reflections and observations of these incredible guests over the last two weeks. If you missed any of them, I highly recommend going back to tune in as there is so much value to be gained from every conversation we have. 
Also, I would love to draw your attention to the British Podcast Awards, where this podcast, Focus on Why, is listed in the Listener's Choice Award, supported by BBC Sounds category. If you enjoy the Focus on Why podcast, you can vote for it. Please do. The Listener's Choice Award rewards the best UK podcast voted by the fans. You can vote for the Focus on Why podcast by clicking on the link in the show notes or going to www.britishpodcastawards.com forward slash vote. You're only allowed to vote for this podcast once and voting will close midday on Monday the 6th of July 2020. The full rules are on the website. Thanks in advance for your vote and for your support. And thank you for tuning into the Focus on Why podcast. I'm loving all your messages that you're sending to me. So please keep them coming. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Thank you for listening to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please leave me a five star iTunes review. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram and Facebook and become a member of the inspiring, uplifting and positive Focus on Why Facebook group. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why.